uh, without further ado, according to program, I'm going to invite Professor Joby Head. Professor Joe, could you please to welcome the remark? Please. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. It's audible. Okay, good. So, um, good evening, everyone. I am Amihe Cho. I have assumed the duty of the lead person of the mains since this April this year. The former lead person, Professor Kyung Tae Bak, has taken a new duty to cover the university-wide responsibility. And I, although quite new to the university, has taken the job. So it is really with great honor that I welcome all the participants of the democracy and social movement in Asia on behalf of the mains. As all of us, uh, all of you already know, the main aims to nurture the active uh, participants to build the cooperative civil society in Asia. So this annual May 18 Memorial Program is one of the highlight events of the Mains. So together with our partner organization, the May 18 Memorial Foundation, we strongly wish to commemorate the spirit of, uh, the spirit of humanitarian civil movement in Korea and forge solidarity and democracy across borders in Asia. I thank all of you for sharing valuable time to join this solidarity session um, and the foundation for facilitating this wonderful gathering. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Professor Jo Mihe. And now, may I invite uh, Professor Park Kyung Tae. He was uh, congratulatory remarks. Professor Park, he's in Gwangju now. Please come to the podium to show your face. I think I can. I think I can. Oh, okay, so okay, so everyone can record. So okay, here. I hope. Hey everyone. Hey, uh, everyone. Uh, nice to see you again. Nice see you again. I can I recognize can most, of you. most of you. Some of you, some of you uh, were. I did not did teach not some uh, uh, certain batches of mains, uh, but uh, I, I can recognize all, most of you. I'm very happy to see you again. And uh, uh, this is a very special moment. We are in, many of us are in Guangzhou now, and uh, um, we are uh, not, not celebrating, memorizing the Guangzhou democracy movement, which happened 41 years ago, uh, when the meaning of us uh, gathering here today is to uh, strengthen our you know, solidarity for Asian democracies, especially the uh, Myanmar situation. Uh, we, uh, I believe all of us are supporting Myanmar citizens, uh, their efforts for democracy. And uh, I believe what we talk today will produce, you know, um, positive message to Myanmar and to uh, all other Asian countries. I uh, expect uh, to hear good, you know, reports from various alumni. Thank you very much. I enjoy the uh, whole meeting today. Thank you. Uh, it was 1995, long ago already. Long ago. Yeah. The main program started in 2007. Seven. Wow, so you know everybody. <laughs> well, most, mostly, mostly, yes. Now I'm going to... I, I can't I can't hear is, is is it my turn? 
So we are, we, we are hearing you very well. Okay, okay. Professor Joe, could you please? Okay, is, is it my turn? Okay, it's on. It's on. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, it, it's very nice uh, to see all of you, <laughs> old faces, new faces, and particularly old faces seem to be getting older and older. <laughs> it's, still very, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, tonight. All right, uh, uh, I, I was asked to, to make some opening remarks. I don't know uh, the, the difference between uh, welcoming remarks and opening remarks, so I have prepared some uh, slides to show you. So it's, it's just bear with me. I, I will share my slides with you. Uh, can somebody in the host position to allow me to share my uh, slides, please. To focus, focus Okay, just a minute, please. Okay. Can you unload yourself? No, not yet. I'm not allowed. Okay. <clears throat> Just a minute. Okay, now it's okay. Your co host. All right. Uh, yep. Wow. Groomy. Okay. Uh, can, can, you, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Right, thank you. Uh, the answer more has asked me to make some opening remarks for about seven and eight minutes, but I, I think it, it will it will be uh, finished before that. Anyway, uh, the hello and welcome to the Asia Democracy Forum. Uh, as a way of opening up today's uh, discussion, I would like to introduce some of the salient features in the current development and challenges of democracy in Asia. The following talking points are only indicative checklists. They are neither intended to be exhaustive nor should they be seen as a perimeter for our discussion tonight. Uh, democracy in COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated already precarious democratic situation in Asia. As a way of suppressing the pandemic, many countries in the region relied on such heavy-handed measures as indiscriminate lockdowns suspension of freedom of movement and expression, and expanding police powers. This trend may be called a coercive politicization of health and disease, which can easily translate into the expansion of authoritarian handling of the citizen's space, <clears throat> worsening quality of democracy. Asia has become, perhaps inadvertently, the very epicenter of the global tension between democracy and authoritarianism. <clears throat> Asia is now home to the world's most vibrant and expanding economies. And the young reason has more than half of the burgeoning millennial population in the world. But the reason's present reality in regard to democratic governance is multidimensional and not so straightforward. Some kind of erosion of democratic quality has occurred in the region in the form of less democratic leaning and more authoritarian governing style. Of course, this worrying sign, however serious it may seem, needs to be viewed against the backdrop of the region's long-standing history of oppression and democratic struggle. So, optimism and pessimism simultaneously some recurring barriers to democracy. Although the majority of people in Asia lend their support to democracy, at least in principle, different countries tend to emphasize different aspects of democracy. There are countries in Asia where religion comes to the top of many people's priority concern. There are also countries where public support for the freedom of the press and support for civil society is not strong enough 
to make democracy healthy and viable. As a result of this trend, some populist leaders are inclined to sideline the legitimate concern about human rights and civic freedom. In some cases, economic growth is strongly preferred democratic value and practice. As the level of wealth has been increasing throughout the Asian region, so has the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Asia has become one of the fastest growing regions in the world in terms of inequality gap. This kind of discontent has made the emergence of egregious strongman political elites, such as Narendra Modi in India and Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. Continuing challenges of the old institutions. The prospect of democracy does not look promising in some parts of Asia at the moment. The military in Myanmar, which already maintained the control of Myanmar's government to a great extent, grabbed power through a coup early this year and embarked on a series of rampant killings and brutal suppression of the population to the horror of the, of the world. The military also maintains power in Thailand, for instance, alongside the monarchy, adamantly resisting call for restoring democracy. There is even a sign of return to the military's more visible role in keeping domestic unrest at bay in times of severe frustration and pandemic in some countries. Thinking space for autonomous civil society. This will be uh, the dealt with, uh, in the, you know, the, uh, uh, the next speaker more thoroughly. There is deep concern that in some places, new legislation limiting individual freedom and civil liberties, civil society organizations, religious institutions, and the freedom of the press has been set in place. There is also a deteriorating media environment within the region, including censorship regulations, hampering of autonomous media outlets, and violent suppression of journalists. Gloomy prospects of vulnerable cities. According to a recent study, Asia is home to 99 of the world's 100 most vulnerable cities. Of the 100 cities worldwide, most vulnerable to environmental hazards, all but one are in Asia and 80% are in India or China. More than 400 large cities with a total population of 1.5 billion are at high or extreme risk because of a mix of life shortening pollution, dwindling water supplies, deadly heat waves, natural disasters, and climate emergency. This environmental breakdown is truly a terrifying reality, which will have unimaginable potential to dwarf other usual challenges in regard to democratic governance in the whole Asian region. In conclusion, these are some of the urgent and salient indicators, which may have huge implications for the state of affairs in democracy, human rights, and civil society in Asia in the years to come. I hope tonight's discussion would yield some fruitful results in furthering our understanding of the challenges Asia is now facing and giving us some insight for our creative engagement and action. Thank you for uh, listening uh, with such a great focus and attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Cho, uh, same question. When did you start teaching? As a discussion, I think so. Uh, in, in the year 1999. 1999. So you must know all the, the alumni of the mains, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. They are, they are getting older. Okay, so this is a not formal, but <laughs> informal general assembly of all the mains alumni. I, I'm wondering if you have seen the logo of the Mains program. So this time uh, we create a logo for all the alumni. As you can see, um, can you see the logo? The, I don't know, I cannot control the computer. 
Professor Joe, can you show the first page of your PowerPoint? I see the new logo for Mainz. Okay. First page of your PowerPoint. Yes, right. So I hope uh, this reflects the spirit of Mainz. Uh, can you recognize the map, the green color? It's a little bit strange, right? This is the Asia upside down. They reflect the spirit of the main program. The whole world is now upside down, you know? So we have to make it right, you know? So that's why we purposely the, uh, portray the Asia map this way. And also green means since 2007. I hope you like the, this, um, the spirit behind this logo. So we are going to use this one for uh, this program and hopefully we can organize a similar meetings throughout the year and also the next year, uh, or is May 18th. Now in this uh, Zoom, I see about 30, uh, over 30 uh, participants in the Zoom. And as you know, 11 volunteer to be a panelist. So four of us are sitting together. If you look at the, the program, we have a five from uh, back 2020. And also we have uh, the first year, 2007, we had two person, the nucleus Rashid in 2007, and then one uh, uh, Biaka from 2008, 2009. So from different batches, we have all together 11 uh, panelists. And we have also one more presentation, Joseph from Civicus. Let me check, Joseph, are you in the room? Joseph? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Okay, very good. He speaks, you are speaking from Malaysia, right? Yes. Okay, thank you for your time and effort to be with us. He has been um, researching, he's been charged of researching on the civic space and the civic course. And he's going to give us where we are now in terms of democracy and civic space. And then we can open the floor for among the panelists. Joseph, you have a floor now, please. Thank you, Anselmo. And I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. Hopefully, oh, it's, it's disabled. Uh, can you help me uh, give me access to the screen sharing facility? I think you, you are co-host, right? Uh, it says here, host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, just a minute. Okay. One second. Sure, no problem. Okay, now you are co-host. Ah, okay. Now I can. <laughs> Let me know if you can see my screen now. Yes. Good. Great. Okay, so good evening, everyone, and, and thank you very much uh, to Anselmo for inviting me to speak um, at this session on democracy and social movements in Asia. If at any time you, I lose, you lose sound or you can't see my PowerPoint, please feel free to interject, because sometimes I know with communications, it can be challenging. Um, so I, I'm Joseph Benedict. I am the researcher with uh, the Civicus Monitor, and I'll, I'll come to what we do a bit more later. But... What I will try to cover today in, in my short presentation is uh, to look at the state of civic space uh, in Asia based on the findings of uh, Civicus and share with you a bit about why we think civic space uh, is shrinking in, in the region uh, based on our data and analysis, particularly from the Civicus monitor. I will also share some of the main civic space violations that we are seeing in the region based on our 2020 data and, and a report that I think some of you may have also seen called People Power Under Attack. Uh, I will also highlight some of the countries of concern that we have that we've been following over, over the last few years. And then finally, um, some suggestions on some of the ways civil society is pushing back against the increasing repression of fundamental freedoms uh, in this region. Uh, and I also look forward to your reflections at the country level of what you are seeing in order to enrich the discussion today. Before I start, let me briefly introduce uh, Civicus. Uh, let me see, how do I move? 
to the next screen. Okay. Uh, so Silicus, for those of you who may have not come across the organization, is a global civil society alliance of over 10,000 civil society groups and activists in 175 countries. We are headquartered in Johannesburg in, in South Africa, and we work to defend and promote civic space or civic freedoms. We work to strengthen the power of citizen action, and we work to build an effective and accountable civil society. As many of you, I'm sure, know that civic space is centered on the freedoms of expression, on association and peaceful assembly. And many of these protections of these freedoms are guaranteed in many of our national constitutions here in Asia, as well as in international human rights law and standards. Uh, in, in particular, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which a number of countries in Asia have ratified. Separate from international law, we all know that within the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030 and its goals, there are very clear commitments to civic space that are enshrined in Goals 16 and 17 on the protection of fundamental freedoms and encourage and promote the effective civil society partnerships. So for countries who have not ratified the ICCPR, there are still very clear global commitments towards civic space and civic freedoms. We believe that at Civicus that when civic space is open, citizens and civil society are able to organize, to participate and to communicate without hindrance. And in doing so are able to claim their rights and influence the political and social structures around them. Now in 2016, uh, Civicus developed a tool to monitor fundamental freedoms as we saw the increasing assault of uh, civic space across the globe. The Civicus Monitor is an online platform tracking civic space in 196 countries and done in collaboration with civil society. So we have a, a, a group of partners that we work with in order to collect the data and to monitor what's going on. The monitor provides information and ratings on the country's civic space in order to offer comparisons between countries. And ratings are provided on a five scale defined as open, narrowed, obstructed, repressed, and closed. So five different ratings. These ratings are calculated both from qualitative and quantitative data from international indexes, international ratings, national and international human rights reports, reports that many of you are already have been working on at the local level and at the regional level, as well as our own civicus analysis. In addition, we also produce data to complement the ratings, what we call civic space updates from Civicus Monitor Research Partners, contain qualitative narrative information related to the situation for civil society in a country. And this data is generated through a collaboration with more than 20 civil society organizations. And I encourage you, if you have time after this, to go through uh, this data to see if it's capturing the civic freedoms in your country. Now, what is the state of civic space in Asia? Every year we publish a report called People Power Under Attack, reporting on the global and regional civic space trends uh, around the world. If you look at this map that, that we have produced of 25 Asian countries, the story is actually quite worrying. Four countries, China, Laos, North Korea, and Vietnam are rated as close in, in the Civicus Monitor. Nine other countries as what we consider repressed, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Brunei, and the Philippines, and nine others as what we consider as obstructed or somewhere in the middle. Civic space in Japan and South Korea is rated as narrowed, and Taiwan is the only country that's rated as open. So this is the picture that we have been uh, getting from the findings that we have on the ground. Now, what are we seeing with regards to this data? If you look at this graphic from two years ago in 2018, people in Asia, uh, living in Asia from closed and repressed countries, the, the worst of ratings, made up about 50% of the population of Asia, roughly. But if you look at the data that we collected last year and, and from this rating, you will see now that 86% of the population in Asia now lived in closed and repressed countries. There is nearly over 36% shift change over the last two years. And this is really extremely worrying for Civicus. Now, for some of you, these statistics might sound quite abstract, but in practice, they mean that most people in Asia today take very big risks if they choose to get involved in peaceful activism. This includes activism that directly challenges those in power, 
those fighting for economic social rights, and those seeking accountability for abuses. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture that we really need to analyze and figure out how we, we address. Now, what are some of the top violations or the main violations that we have been seeing, particularly in, in 2020? And I'll go through some of them now. Across Asia, the main civic space violation we documented in 2020 is the use of draconian restrictive laws to undermine fundamental freedoms in at least 19 countries in Asia. These are laws related to national security, including anti-terrorism laws, public order laws, and particularly criminal defamation laws that have been used to silence the opposition in, in many countries. In at least 16 countries, human rights defenders have been prosecuted. And the number one, obviously, is China, where civic space is rated close, and scores of activists, lawyers, and critics have been detained on vague and overly broad charges. The Communist Party has also escalated its repression in Hong Kong. In other countries like Cambodia, we see Hun Sen's government increasingly use incitement laws to prosecute activists. While in Bangladesh, the Digital Security Act and online defamation law is the weapon of choice to go after media workers, activists, academics, students, and anyone critical of the authorities. In Vietnam, which is the number one jailer of human rights defenders in Southeast Asia, many have been convicted after a one-day trial under an array of restrictive laws. So this seems to be the main tool used by many authoritarian governments based on the data for 2020. What we're also seeing is restrictive NGO laws coming about more and more. Particularly, we see this in countries like India with the Foreign Contributions uh, Regulation Act, controlling the funding that NGOs can receive in countries like Pakistan. And now, most recently, we are seeing this in Thailand, where an NGO, restrictive NGO law is being proposed. The second area is around censorship which is a major threat to civic and democratic freedoms in Asia that we found in 18 countries. But we all know China has an extensive censorship regime to block websites, cover up their persecution in Xinjiang and Tibet, and censor articles. But even in countries like Pakistan, we are seeing the authorities attempt to silence media outlets for their critical reporting or block online content. They've also harassed or criminalized journalists. In Thailand, we have seen censorship increase under uh, the current government around protests with international outlets being cut off and journalists targeted. The third area is an alarming increase of online and offline harassment of activists and journalists in 14 countries in Asia. Vietnam continues to harass those who criticize the one-party regime, including activists and bloggers. Many are kept under surveillance or detained for long periods without access to legal counsel and subject to abusive interrogations. Even a country like Indonesia, which has some level of open space, we have seen severe violations of attacks against those who, who raise issues around, say, West Papua, including digital attacks, smear campaigns, and surveillance. And in Sri Lanka, we are seeing activists and family of survivors also facing intimidation and increased surveillance. Another major violation is the disruption of protests and the arrest of protests. In a number of countries, including Bangladesh, Cambodia, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Thailand, police use excessive force against peaceful protesters. And in virtually most of these cases, no one was held accountable for these violations. Particular groups that we see being targeted from our data includes land and environmental human rights defenders, LGBTI activists, minority groups, migrant refugee activists, and labor activists. And another layer of repression that has happened over the last year, as many of you, have, I'm sure, are aware, is COVID-19, which has been used as a pretext for repression. With the pandemic, we have seen many countries in Asia go beyond justifiable restrictions with negative consequences on civic space. This includes overtly broad and restrictive emergency laws in countries like Cambodia, Thailand, and Malaysia, and even laws to criminalize what is deemed as fake news uh, for people who are raising questions about the pandemic. We have also seen censorship and restrictions on reporting in countries like China, Bangladesh, India, and Singapore, and a clampdown on those protesting against the government's handling of COVID-19. We've also seen increased surveillance and violations of the right to privacy. So this is another layer of violations that we need to really unpack and really analyze what's happening in our own countries. Now I want to speak about a number of countries where there's been a significant deterioration of civic space 
particularly countries who used to be a bastion of democracy, who we look to for, for, for that uh, op opening up of space, but now have deteriorated over the last couple of years. Firstly, of course, as mentioned previously, is India, which in 2019, Civicus Monitor downgraded from obstructed to repressed. We have seen the continued persecution of human rights defenders, student leaders, journalists, and those protesting on various issues, including the Citizenship Act. There's been a variety of laws used, including national security and counterterrorism legislation to detain activists. And I mentioned earlier the Foreign Contributions Act, a law controlling foreign funding, has been used to target outspoken groups. And due to this, Amnesty International this year shut down previously Greenpeace was shut down because of the law. Another country that is extremely uh, worrying in, in 2020 is the Philippines, which was downgraded again to repress. What has contributed to this downgrading is attacks on media freedoms. The largest media network in the country, ABS-CBN, was forced to, off the air, depriving people of critical information during the COVID pandemic. While a senior, well-respected journalist, Maria Reza from Rappler, was found guilty of cyber label, libel in a case that many believe was politically motivated. Across the Philippines, we have seen human rights defenders being attacked, being killed with impunity, or being criminalized or subjected to what they consider red, red tagging, meaning to label individuals as communists or terrorists as a result of their work. And much more worrying, a new anti-terror law was passed in July that gives law enforcement powers large amounts of uh, powers with little safeguards from abuse, leaving it to exploitation. Other countries that where we have seen significant uh, patterns of assault on civic space is Sri Lanka, where, as I mentioned earlier, intensified surveillance and harassment of civil society, human rights defenders, particularly since the Rajapaksa regime has come back into power in 2019. We all know about the rapidly shrinking space in Hong Kong, where we have seen mass protests since 2019 against the extradition bill. Dozens of uh, individuals have been arrested, charged, and convicted for speaking up. And the national security law has created a chilling effect on civil society and dissent. And of course, as mentioned also earlier, Myanmar following the coup on, in February 2021, there has been a serious crackdown against activists, protesters, and others across the country. The internet and media outlets have been blocked and laws tightened by the junta to punish dissent. Now, I've, I've spoken a lot about the bad news, but all is not bad, all is not gloomy. Uh, we, we see all across the region, civil society and human rights defenders, like many of you, pushing back against this shrinking space. And they're using various tools and tactics in order to, to push back and to open up the space where, where feasible. What are some of the, the tools that they have been using? Firstly, I think the power of protest continues to be an important tool. We have documented that despite the pandemic, urgent demand for rights brought people from at least 15 countries in Asia onto the streets to demand political and structural change. We saw this in Thailand, in Indonesia, in India, and so forth. And they continue to mobilize using very creative and alternative forms of protests, including online and mass and distance protests. Second is the building of networks and alliances across borders. We have seen this with uh, the Murti Alliance, I'm some, sure some of you know, that has brought people from different countries like Thailand, Myanmar, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, and other countries to support each other during these challenging periods. We have seen the solidarity movement supporting the farmers' protests in India that's been going on for many months now and pushing uh, the Modi government to review their, their position on, on some of the farming laws. And we have seen also the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar who are pushing back on the military junta as well as in many other countries. Third is undertaking research and documentation at the local level, exposing abuses to the outside world. Activists are using these tools to a new and innovative tools to capture human rights violations, including in very close countries like Vietnam, and to share them with international organizations and the UN. Fourthly is the use of international advocacy, including engaging diplomatic missions in a country. This is very important for very close countries when civil society doesn't exist, you have embassies playing that role. And one clear example of the amazing mobilization is the groups and networks who have pushed to highlight the serious violations in the Xinjiang region against the Uyghurs and pushing for international sanctions. Civil society also have used the Human Rights Council uh, to push for countries to be highlighted there, 
such as Philippines in 2019-2020. FIF is working closely with media and journalists to tell stories of the repression of civic space. Here in Malaysia during the pandemic, activists worked with um, news outlets like Al Jazeera to expose the restrictions against migrants and refugees during the pandemic. The media played a critical role in Hong Kong, India, and other places in telling stories we often fail to get much attention on. And finally, civil society has also used strategic litigation to go to the courts to try and push back on restrictive laws and policies. In Indonesia, a court ruled in June 2020 that the government's decision to impose an internet blackout in West Papua region violated the law. In, in Myanmar, NGOs played a key role in bringing Myanmar before the International Court of Justice. So I'd like to end now by saying that my experience has shown that being involved in documenting and supporting activists in Asia has taught me that change does not happen overnight. Indeed, not in days, weeks, or months, but sometimes years of persistence. And in many places, social change is messy and slow. But if we want a brighter future, we must have the bravery to stand with civil society and push governments to defend civic space. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I think it was really comprehensive and it was an overview of what's happening in democracy in Asia and also uh, strategies, how and what can we do together to push back. Thank you for your very um, valuable input. Um, now we are going to start the open discussion. And I want to suggest uh, first, uh, uh, Professor Cho, could you please share your PowerPoint in the chatting room? Because we have a two common input. One is uh, kind of political framework, how we understand these trends and the issues in Asia. You gave us a five framework. And then now we have a civic input, very uh, vivid description of what's really happening on the ground and also some strategies. So with this one, we are going to start our uh, open discussion. Uh, dear panelists, I want to suggest the purpose of this session twofold. One is uh, we are expecting you to give us some, from your own perspective, your country and sector, and uh, maybe you can highlight more some issues, And but it's not your presentation. You can highlight, I want to make a more interactive dialogue. The first part is where we are now, you know, what's happening. How do you understand this, all the challenges and threat to democracy? And second part is what can we do together? Well, we means as a main alumni and students or civil society or social movement in Asia or together with the May 18 Foundation. As you know, you know, visit to Gwangju around the May 18 has been tradition. It's a core part of the main program. So we are bigger family of the Gwangju Democracy Forum. So what can we do together? You know? Okay, so these are the two parts. So uh, first part is uh, general, and so think about what can you say the two, two, two times. And before that, I would like to suggest we have a group photo. This is a really rare opportunity. So I want to have a group photo in solidarity with the people in Myanmar, you know, while we are talking here, still many people are getting killed, you know. And then, so I think it's important to show our solidarity first before we talk, okay? So can you open your camera? So everybody show your face. Let's see how old you are now. Uh, <laughs> Professor, uh, they want to know how much you are or how old are you now? So please show your camera. And then we need to show our three fingers. Remember our three finger? You can use a both. Sometimes use a both, one for Myanmar, the other one for Thailand, you know? Okay, so this is for all. Okay. All right. So one, two, three. Stay on, we need to take a twice because the zoom is a it's not big enough to accommodate all, so we need a two two times. All right. Okay, yes, sir. Done. Okay, I want to make sure that Professor Jo Mihae, Jo Hyoje, and Park Kyung Tae 
in the, in the photo. And the Joseph, of course, you are welcome. Now you are the uh, member of the main family. No? Okay, let me check. So one more time, one more time. Okay, uh, you can bring your family members. I'm very good. So we are extended family. Yes, sir. Come on, though. Hasan, we're here. Am I on? Here, I'm here. Okay. Now, Hasan, we're there. Here, we go. Okay, one more, one more. Last time. Ah, Mamun, you can show your your child. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, thank you for your cooperation. So now uh, we have uh, 11 panelists. Let me see who wants to speak first. I don't want to follow the so called Asian seniority. No? Seniority <laughs> means 2007 AD. This is too mechanical, too traditional, right? So let's say freestyle, no? real interactive. Who wants to speak first? Please raise up your hand. I'll give a floor. And the first part is we have a two inputs. What is your comment? What are the real threats and challenge to democracy? Why? You know, this analytical part, you know, the why. As you know, 40 years ago, this is a 41st uh, anniversary of Gwangju. You know? About 30 years ago, 1996, we have a people power in the Philippines. As you know, we have a movie in Korea, 1987. So middle of 80s is a wave of democratization in Asia. And also seven or eight years ago, you know, there was another wave of democratization in Nepal, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, you know, one after another. But suddenly, two or three years ago, starting from Hong Kong, of course, Hong Kong is another democratization wave, and the Hong Kong, Cambodia, Thailand, and Myanmar, and also even Nepal, even Sri Lanka, everywhere, you know, why, you know, why? You know? So let me ask who wants to speak first. Let me invite um, our friends from uh, South Asia first. Okay. And then maybe Cruz, could you start first? Sri Lanka? Why? You know, why? You, you don't need to describe, you know, so we know already, you know, from the input. Why? You know, why do you think Sri Lanka is going back on? You know? No, 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 without slides, you can speak. No? We wish he prepared a PowerPoint, so we'll share with you in the chatting room. Okay? Could you please, like, why, why Sri Lanka? Of course, I have prepared. Uh, the sign, but I don't want to share everything here. But I think I can share something uh, related to the point you said to Sri Lankan because it is related to the memorial memorialized. Because the the, the point you said, of course, we know what happened. Uh, how the youth uh, uprising came mm -hmm. to this place and what happened, what the government did to those people, those who uh, demonstrate or those who protest against those governments, they were fighting for the democracy. It was the, it was like this. It happened in Sri Lanka also for after the independence in '48, the independence from the British. The the independence as soon as they got the independence, the government, the British given the power to the uh, the single majority, and because of that, the, the majority group wanted to suppress the minority group because at that time the minority groups were in education field they were in a high position and they went all the officers and in a high position so that the minority the majority wanted to suppress this minority group because of that they they have taken over all the crimes of the people the youth the education and employment and everything taken from the minority groups and they were 
in favor of you know, the majority group because it is because that they want to get the voting uh yeah voting from their majority okay cool. and, what you're saying is in the Sri Lanka, the main reason that you know the pushing back of democracy is yes. moderate and minor. The moderate people to take all. There was a cause of problem. Okay, there is a source of the political instability in Sri Lanka. Okay, let me start. With. Okay, let me go with a common trend, you know. So we have a two input. I want to hear directly from the people from the region. And we have also participants from Bangladesh. What about uh uh, Bangladesh, uh, Rashi, Mamun, how is the Bangladesh? How is the situation in uh, Bangladesh? Now, Bangladesh, uh, according to was obstructed, you know, from narrow to obstructed. What is your assessment of democracy in Bangladesh? Rashid? Yeah, thank you. Hello? Hello? Oh, you look very healthy. Yeah. Good. This is Mamun from the yourself also. Yeah. This is this is Mamun from the Bangladesh. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Oh yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, actually the democracy situations uh in the Bangladesh looks like the other countries of the Asia. I mean, uh, you know the overall the situations. So here is the major problem is the institutional the corruption is the major problem. Uh, here the I mean, in my the presentation, I told you uh, that uh, there is a, a lot of the problem of the institutional, the governance problem, mainly, and uh, the democratic process. Uh, I mean, you know that uh, the government is the, in the democratic process uh, several times uh, by the voting of the people or whatever it is. I'm not uh, talking about this issue, but uh, in my the presentation, I told you, uh, I mean, uh, I had the interest to talk about that. Uh, it is the institutional governance and okay. the engagement of the youth, yeah, engagement of the youth and the public uh, diplomacy. Uh, I talk about the public yeah. diplomacy. Uh, I mean, the engagement of the youth, especially in the reduce the institutional uh, corruption in the Bangladesh. It's a very, uh, I mean, the severity problems. Uh, it's a difference uh, between the have and have not. So okay. this is the main problem in, in, in okay. the context Thank you very of Bangladesh. Much. So Bangladesh institutional corruption or the weak governance, you know, according to Civicus report, we have eight countries, South Asia, only two are rated as a narrow. That is a Sri Lanka and Nepal. The rest, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, all obstructed, you know. Okay, these are situation in South Asia. But let me invite, we have a two uh, panelists from India uh Kas and O'Neill. So what is your assessment? Do you think India is keep going down according to do you agree to Civicus assessment and why? You know, what are the main the reasons? O'Neill, can you start first? O'Neill, please introduce yourself also. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh yes. Yeah, uh, no, hi. Uh I'm O'Neill and uh it's good to see some of my old friends around here as well as my uh, it's indeed a great honor uh, to meet my old professor, Professor Su Hyoje at Tung Pei Park, and I'm very, <laughs> and I'm very thankful for uh, 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 more for uh, bridging all the Asian communities. Yeah, uh, right now uh, in India is uh, at a very grim situation in terms of the uh, democracy is concerned. The one of the biggest problem we have the challenges. At the moment is about the the one India policy, one language policy, one religion policy is the uh, a major hurdles to the uh, democratic movement in India, and uh, so uh, uh, because the, uh, India is a society which uh, is a country that which is a very heterogeneous country, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, people Christians which are. Uh, well, practicing which are uh, much before the Hindu comes as well and uh, we have a Buddhism uh, the, uh, which uh, where the Indian uh, majority of the Indian doesn't practice because of the fact that they don't want to eat <laughs> and, uh, and we have a, a largest Muslim community uh, more than the Pakistan's population basically uh, the, the population of the uh, Indian Muslim is more than the Pakistan and uh, so in this uh, uh
uh, country where the uh, if you try to look for the one religion and uh, one uh, uh, one language, we have about uh, 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 we have about uh, in northeastern alone is around six hundred uh, linguistic languages, different languages that there. Uh, and all uh, across India would be more than 1,000 uh, different languages would be there. And where uh, 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 Hindi would be the largest speaker because of the population concentration at the uh, central India. And uh, so, uh, so, uh, so I think uh, in the last uh, five years, uh, when BJP, the regime of the Hindu, this uh, uh, fanatic regime comes to power and uh, it is uh, more than uh, more than 2,000 uh, activists. Okay, uh, Onil, yeah. Onil yeah. Uh, can I say what you are saying is Hindu fundamentalism is one of the the main cause of you know the you know the your democracy downgrading. Yes. You are, which part of India are you from? You are from Northeast India, right? Yes, yes. I'm from Northeast India. Yeah. Okay. From your point of view, because you said the uh, one India, one religion, and one language. Under yeah. the Hindu fundamentalism, although the India is really diverse, culturally religious, this is one of the the, the main problem. Let me ask uh, your colleague. You know, uh, Bia Kas, you're also from India. Which part of India are you from? Now? I'm also from the northeast. I'm from Assam, which is close to oh, Manipur. Also, I think okay. my previous two years from introduced. You are oh, the okay. second batch, right? 2008. I'm from the 2008 batch. Yes. Okay. Could you please introduce and then what do you think? the main cause of the, the India democracy downgrading. Right. Thank you, Anselmo, firstly, for giving me this opportunity to meet my friends. I can see Musa's face smiling over there, UP, O'Neill, who's the previous speaker. I've heard about him. Other friends, Noor Khalis and Professor Cho Yoje. Great to see him. Yes, some of us, he's right, are getting older. Some of us are looking older. <laughs> so I think that's the little difference. Uh, I think, you know, this is, a, this is the question that we are all asking today. And uh, my previous speaker has covered quite a broad array of, uh, I think, issues that make up what is India today. But I think, you know, we, it, this, this, what is India today and the kind of democratic shrinking that we are seeing is not happening overnight. Yes, the current government that is in place, which is a right-wing fundamentalist government that's trying to take the country towards in one India, that's true. But, you know, there's a history. And I mentioned that in my PowerPoint, there's a history to all of this. So if you look really, this is there's a dip in the graph. And so far as India is concerned from the late 70s and that dip has continued, except for a brief period between the 90s to the 2000 until 2011. And since then, again, there is that dip. Now, the reason for that, actually, we have to go back to when India was formed. It's very important to understand our partition and how did we start off? See, India started off on a very inclusive framework. The citizenship mm -hmm. that we adopted in 1955 was on the principle of Yasuli. But today we are moving towards a Yas Sanguinis principle, which is exclusion. And if you look at most of India's legal framework, most of India's legal framework, unfortunately, is designed to exclude. So most mm -hmm. of what is happening in India today, apart from what's been spoken by Mr. Joseph from the Civicus in terms of the arrests of the journalists, the democratic institutions being compromised, political appointments in democratic institutions. What is also you know, important to understand, and this is where I'm doing my current PhD, is citizenship and statelessness. A lot of people are becoming stateless because the laws are designed in a way that people become stateless because they are not included. And the laws have carried on from the 1970s, from the time we've built the laws until now, we have the latest, which is the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019. Yeah. But there's one before that, quickly, I just want to mention the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2004, which says yeah. one parent of the child has to be an Indian citizen and the other parent cannot be an illegal migrant. Now, who's an illegal migrant? That's in the domain of ambiguity. And this is what is not being addressed today. And a lot of people, especially the Muslim religious minority and linguistic minorities like me who have come from Bangladesh, my parents have come from there. We are today considered as foreigners and outsiders and we are not part of the democracy okay, experiment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A lot Thank of us are... Oh, yes, sir. Okay, so I, we got your point. I think very similar to Sri Lanka, you know, the exclusive policy, you know, majority and minority instead of coexistence and pluralistic approach. This is uh, one of the main reasons for, 
erosion of democracy in India. Let me go to your neighboring country, uh, Pakistan. You know, uh, according to CV Cruz report, there are five countries mentioned, you know, country of concern. There was India, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Myanmar, Hong Kong. That does not mean other countries are okay, right? So let me go to the uh, Pakistan. Uh, Rizwan, Shaikh, how is the Pakistan situation now? Thank you. In terms of democracy. Yes, uh, I will respond to that. First of all, I must thank this opportunity to speak in this forum. And also a uh, very good evening and good day, depending on wherever you are. Uh, so it's uh, so nice to see all of my alumni and my professors. So uh, coming back to your question, Pakistan gained independence uh, in 1947 from the British and inherited most of the strategies that British used to do or apply on their subject population. For example, British developed a very strong military structure and bureaucratic structure within the country and also feudalism. So even uh, same, uh, although uh, our neighboring country, India, uh, they do not have the military interference in their political affair, uh, affairs, but in the context of Pakistan, uh, military strongly influences uh, uh, political uh, affairs in the country. But there is also, uh, military solely cannot be blamed. Uh, military is not stopping the bureaucracy from their work, but bureaucratic mindset uh, is developed over the years such a way that they think gods of civil rather than civil servants. Similarly, politicians politicians have earned themselves a very bad name because of their corruption, because of their ill-gotten money that we only come to know through uh, various investigative reports through Panama or other, other papers that come out and they tell that they have stashed billions of dollars outside the country while the country is in debt uh, uh, so these uh, but uh, but whenever elections in the country take place so uh, okay. we see the meddling of all these three major actors whether this is bureaucracy or political uh, or politicians or even the military into choosing their own form of governance which is made through uh, through their own nexus but ultimately uh, democracy is being uh, uh, democracy's image is being tarnished. While coming back to uh, one last comment of, uh, regarding media, we discussed about uh, issues related with media and journalists. But we, I think, we need to discuss also about corporatization of media, especially by corporate world who have dominated media so much that journalists are unable to speak. They either they have to worry about their jobs or speak the truth. So I think this factor needs to be uh, explored more. Okay, thank you very much. Troika of three, you know, military, political, and bureaucracy, you know, the, in negative sense, and this is uh, one of the core structural problems for erosion of democracy in uh, Pakistan. Let's go to the Nepal, you know. As you know, Nepal was the champion of democracy the last 10 years, but recently we are hearing some are uh, not very positive news from Nepal, you know? But Nepal and Sri Lanka still remain you know, narrowed, you know? So still better than any other country. What's happening in Nepal, Hindu? Could you please tell us what is the, why? Why is a, such a not very positive news these days from Nepal? Well, I promise, um, nice to hear, but actually I'm, I'm really sad to say that experience real democracy in Nepal. Uh, although hundreds of thousands of people sacrificed their lives for our democracy. Uh, recently, uh, our Prime Minister uh, unconstitutionally uh, moved to the Gulf Fargan uh, in uh, December, uh, which was uh, actually uh, an attack on democracy. Uh, so uh, different politics is uh, being very messy. Uh, and recently, the government also proposed some uh, liberties uh, that would uh, threaten the uh, free speech and uh, it also allowed the government uh, to spy on citizens uh, with legal oversight. So we are facing multiple challenges. Uh, although we got a new constitution uh, in 2015, uh, 2015 
which is that we have to back to me here. So, actually, we are so happy that we are getting new persecution and maybe everyone is going to be happy. Uh, but uh, the new persecution was not welcome by uh, every people. It became so controversial because uh, it does not uh, address the issues of uh, many uh, class, many indigenous people, uh, also uh, the religion and uh, the women's rights. So, uh, as the uh, previous speakers mentioned about uh, uh, the problems we are facing in their countries, uh, so we are not like very far from that. Uh, we also have uh, like only one language, which is not like mainstream, and other languages are being uh, discriminated. Uh, and many uh, uh, so, uh, many groups are being socially excluded uh, by the law. Uh, and we also have the uh, big problem of uh, people. Uh, between rich and poor, so we have a lot of challenges. So, uh, as we know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, let me describe that the whole world uh, is uh, now facing uh, uh, challenges, and then our democracy is going in crisis. Uh, but I still, I'm hopeful that because. Uh, we, uh, uh, especially the pro democracy uh, people who are activists, we are getting together and uniting together to fight mm -hmm. for the democracy. And I'm really happy yeah. that we are, we are still fighting and getting up. Okay, thank you very much. Nepal, again, this is uh, exclusive, uh, not inclusive enough. You know, you have a new constitution, but not inclusive enough. This is another cause of the the conflict in the country. So I think these are, we heard from the six people in the six countries, South Asia, you can see the common, and of course there are some the country specific differences. Let's move to the Southeast Asia. Compared to South Asia, Southeast is half obstructed, uh, half narrowed, you know, a little bit better than South Asia. So let's begin with the less challenging, less difficult countries. Let me see which country, okay, Myanmar, uh, Malaysia. Can you start with uh, Malaysia first? Malaysia, two years ago, there was a, uh, how do you call bossy, right? The people, another people power through the peaceful election. So Malaysia gave us really hope, you know, we can change through peaceful election. You know? So what happened now these days, you know? So there is a very al alarming sound here and there, you know? Could you please, why? So I was very hopeful that that time that democracy is a change. So yeah, we managed to change. But then recently, because of the, I can see from my point of view, I think it's too many political games. And what happened was like, there was a, I call it a political coup. Like someone from the same political party uh, betrayed the leader mm -hmm. in the party. So that's why again, it's very, the competition is very based on the mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like racial based, Chinese, Malay, Indian. Because Pakatan Harapan is kind of like very hybrid, you know, like half uh, like Chinese, half uh, Indian. But then, there are certain people, leaders of the party, like really want certain ethics to be more, uh, more obvious and more kind of short privileges. So that is a very problematic thing, yeah, from my perspective, because it's really based on the ethics, like I need to more. And also, in Malaysia, we have so many, like, that I can see, like, from, like, jumping folk, like, one day you're in this one party, and then the next day you're already in another party. So that's why the fraction is really, really like worse. Yeah, and then it's also when I, when Joseph mentions about the freedom of expression, in Malaysia we are really expanding that we are shrinking down the uh, freedom of expression. Like some of activists like Amir Reza recently 
arrested by the Christians because of the same hires, you know. And it's also like I can see that most of our law, like the uh, Christian Act, or the, even we already repel the industry Act, but we have another like source bar, it's, it's still the same. We, we, the activists still can be arrested without uh, like investigation or without uh, trial. So it's reflect how the colonial system is, is still really in print, mm -hmm. it's still in our democratic system. So my question, actually I want to ask a question next to that. that um, if we said we are we are in, in the demobilization process, we have the election, but why then all our laws? Mm -hmm. Like you know, in the ratio, most of the law, like in Germany, really respect the really respected the premium system, mm -hmm. and this is not democracy, it's not right. So, if, I feel that in terms of that, it's like the, the colony, what the colony did is actually not really promoting the democracy, just that the system is not, not real, and, mm -hmm. and also I can see that there is no a real model in participation. I, I don't see like what. Historical model of democracy mm -hmm. So that is my question. Like, I don't see that. Like, I think that's okay. okay. So Malaysia again, um, you know, racial politics or ethnic divide, you yeah. know, instead of so again, this is against the uh, principle of in inclusivity and also colonial legacy, you know, negative sense, you know, these are the multiple factors, and also Malaysia. After Bossy II, uh, another break, um, the breaking, the record breaking, you know, the, you, are, you had the oldest prime minister in the world, right? All the <laughs> prime minister once, you know. So that shows, you know, you have a, a lot of aspiration, but all guys, all they all come back to the politics. This is the source of all the division and the ethnic politics. Okay, let's move to the near neighboring country, Indonesia. You know, in Asia, we call India is the largest democracy in the world, right? And Indonesia is called largest Muslim democracy, right? Muslim democracy. So we have a two panelists from India, very interesting name. The first batch, Nurpolis, and then the youngest one, uh, Hasim, this year batch, you know? So we have a two, old generation and new generation. Let's hear their views, whether there's any difference. Okay, young one first, Hasim. You are now joining the online from Seoul, right? You are still the attending class today, you know? So they are coming down, uh, 2021 batch will come to Gwangju tomorrow okay, to attend the May 18 ceremonies. Hasim, could you please share your view? Uh, thank you, Professor. I will share my uh, view on three things. The first is about police official. The second is a journalist. The last one is a cyber attack. Okay, Hasim, it's not presentation, just respond to the question. Yes. What is the assessment of democracy in India? Oh, sorry, to Indonesia. Is going down like other countries or yeah. more or less okay? I agree with the presentation from the Sifikus presentation that Indonesia is not, not good today. Why? Uh, Why? Uh, generally, we have a uh, low press, good, but in reality, uh, at least to media was attacked by cyber attack. Mm. After media publishes a story about the uh, influencer was spied by maybe uh, it's not gov it's, it's not clear who is spied uh, influencer to uh, support uh, omnibus law uh, bill. And the second is uh, this uh, Tirto uh, uh, Tempo Media. The, la the second is Tirto Media. The media was attacked after the criticize uh, research about COVID-19. It is not standard research. Mm -hmm. uh, military, uh, intelligence agency and University of Airlangga did research, but the research is not standard. After mm -hmm. they published the news, the two or three article was removed by a by, uh, uh hacker the last one is uh felon again a journalist this year is the highest number the case of the violence of journalists at least 
uh, 80, uh, 90 cases of uh, the violent uh, journalists. Recently, a temple journalist was attacked by two police officers in Surabaya after uh, he entered in uh, parting wardis, parting uh, wedis party to confirm the sus person. This is the host of the parties. He is a uh, former of the officer minister of finance. Uh, the journalists want to confirm that uh, mm -hmm. everybody case. After the, there is no success confirmation, but the police officer attacked her. And recently, the after civil society and, and uh, journalist association pressed the gap, Police officer, mm -hmm. uh, police, okay. uh, police officer uh, stated that two uh, police will be uh, sent to jail. Okay. okay, so what you're saying is, you know, the uh, media freedom has been very much restricted, and then there are a lot of human rights violations or violence against journalists. You yourself, uh, journalist by profession, right? Yes, I, I, main thing. Yeah. I, I also uh, said that about Papua. There is no freedom press okay. in Papua. I agree with the uh, statement. Okay, so there is also another serious situation in Papua, you know. Okay, now uh, let's go to the Nur police. Uh, are you are you with us now? Are you ready to speak? Yes. Nur police. Yes. Okay. So we the first go. Match of the mains 2007. That's almost two years ago. Wow, it looks still young. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Anselmo, uh, Your Excellency, uh, our professor, um, uh, Madam Mi Chi Chu, I'm sorry. Uh, Chu Mi Chi. Then, of course, uh, our professor uh, Chu Hyu Chi. Then, our professor. Uh, uh, Kim Tai Park, and uh, uh, of course, unforgettable uh, all my friends, and then all, all, also my classmate uh, Mamun, and I see one more, uh, Mafuza, maybe in London right now you are. Then uh, I would like to uh, share my another perspective. Uh, I'm focused now in globalization and democratization. Then I focus on the role of the corporation, uh, especially um, a mining corporation uh, related with the democratization in one country. I have two conclusions, uh, basically, about uh, this situation uh, uh, related with Indonesian position. First is the uh, the non-complementation of the mining case has uh, implication for the quality of democracy uh, in in a country uh, like Indonesia. This is my first conclusion. The second is uh, countries undergoing democracy transition, such as Indonesia, experience uh, a burden that's not a single. Besides having uh, to uh, receive uh, resolve uh, various human rights violations that still occur during the transition period, it must also have a strong commitment to resolve the human rights uh, violation, including the mining sector, this occurred in the past. So this is two conclusions uh, from me. This is basically the, my, my proposal for my PhD in the University of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I conduct research. Hopefully, uh, the research will be done uh, uh, next years, maybe. So I focus on the how to role of our influence of the mining corporation in the in the democratic situation. So this is uh, uh, Mr. Anselmo. What's honor for me to be here? Then. Today certainly uh, make us remember the spirit of the Guangzhou movement, which have inspiring us to fight to our freedoms. 
So okay. I'm you. very happy okay. today. Uh, All right, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, Police, yeah. many thanks. After 12 years, I see you. <laughs> many thanks, my okay. man. <laughs> Okay. See you, see you soon, yes. So, police, uh, you used to work for National Human Rights Commission, right, when you returned to Indonesia, but now you are working on PhD at the same time, business and human rights, right? So I think he highlighted the new yes. area. Uh, I don't know how to frame, you know, uh, economic democracy or a role of business, because business also negatively linked to the corruption, right? The corruption means usually the business and the politicians, right? So business also important the role to play yes. for corruption democracy. And also our Hashim mentioned about this uh, freedom of expression media, okay? So Malaysia, Indonesia, of course, these two countries facing a lot so, of challenges. Uh, a little bit, uh, Mr. Anselmo, a little bit. Yes. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, yes, uh, now I'm... I am an uh, advisory of the chief of Indonesian police right now. So um, I, I, we have a plan to discuss with the committee to discuss about the condition about Papua, as also, also about the uh, Ahmad Nurhasi mentioned about uh, the cyber attack and, and so on and so on. So, I think this is the difficult situation, of course, but we try to uh, make a, it is better. Okay. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thank All right. you. So yes. let's go to the, your neighboring country. The real challenge, two country, and Myanmar and Thailand. You know. So let's start with the Thailand. So we have our panelists from Thailand. Zoom. Could you please introduce yourself and then. What, what is the real cause of the problem now in Thailand, you know, the military coup years ago, but, you know, now your neighboring country learned from Thailand you know, how to do military coup, you know. So uh, could you please give us your view about uh, Thailand and also a bit about Myanmar? Yeah. Actually, I don't know who learned from whom. Has... But, yeah, but oh, I'm using the... <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm using the... the... Yeah, I don't know who learn from home because uh, we're kind of like a brotherhood of military coup for the past like six decades. Anyway, so hello everyone, I'm Zoom. I'm a main student from last year and I'm from Thailand. So um, if, you, if you have seen or heard from the news, last year we had huge protests, last year we had protests um, in Thailand and it was quite revolutionary to see you know young students coming up to um, to protest against the military back government which is a legacy of the 2014 coup um, this government and also the 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 students also challenged the monarchy which is also um, has acquired the power over the over politics for uh, 70 years, 80 years. So um, what we are experiencing in Thailand, um, and right now, I mean, the government now is suppressing the movement. So what are we, what we're see, seeing now is that the, um, the same situation replaying, replaying again and again in the past uh, 80 years of democracy in Thailand. Uh, we've never had a real democracy since we became a democracy in 1932. The monarchists uh, always try to control the power and the politics through the military coup. And you know, when a new class, for example, in the uh, 70s, a new class of Marxist intellectuals or communists came, um, spread their ideology, then the old power, the monarchist group, tried to take back the power. In the 2000s, um, when the the grassroots people became empowered by the new prime minister um, who, is using, who was using populist um, schemes to court the voters. So the monarchist group also came back to strike back the power. And right now we've seen the young generation who has been um, inspired, not inspired, but um, agitated, uh, who has been kind of uh, engaged with politics through the use of digital media 
through Twitter, through the digital space. So um, now again, we've seen this uh, uh, resistance came back. And then we've seen the military again, and, and the monarchists again, uh, strike back the power. So this is what's going on in Thailand. Um, to see, I think to, to see a broader picture, I think this is what happening in Thailand, in Myanmar, in Hong Kong is quite similar right now, I think. You know, maybe the factors are different, but I think one of the key is the, you know, the young generation of um, protester who came to disrupt this kind of like long-standing culture and this um, authoritarianism. And then they got, and then they use new media to fight this um, old power. But then they are now being suppressed by the law as, uh, you know, con um, draconian law, and then just outright violence. So from Hong Kong, in 2019, and then Thailand, 2020, you know, the movement are now down. And then Myanmar, again, we see the young generation came out and then the movement are down because of that violence again. I think, I don't know in, in other countries in Asia, what's gonna happen, but, you know, we, I think the pattern will, will, will recycle and we'll see more of this. And I think, um, if I can say just one thing, I think this kind of like um, milk tea alliance, this kind of um, pan-Asia solidarity uh, on digital space is quite interesting. How can we utilize this uh, space to maybe bridging with the old civil society, like NGOs, but also we bridging with the online activism. I think we can create you know, a, a force, yeah. So your ending note was very positive. It's a mixed alliance speaker, the million MG generation. So they are using new, new media, the mixed tea to fight against old powers. This is really the time of war. You know, the Hong Kong, Taiwan, the Thailand, Myanmar, you know, all the area. So it's Asia. So thank you for your positive note. And then so we have. Now, finally, we arrive at Myanmar, you know, where the hot spot is basically. And we have all students from Myanmar, the main studies of the day. Hello. Hello. Oh, can I? <laughs> uh, Michelle, Michelle, you can speak now. Okay. Hello, everyone. And this is Michelle from Myanmar. So, could you please repeat your question? Because recently I, I did not hear well. Can you hear me? Oh yes, now it's okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So could you please repeat the question to me? Because Okay, this is a general question. Now we hear every day you know, the news about Myanmar. So uh, could you please describe what, what is your, your own assessment? Because Myanmar is not alone. Myanmar is a part of overall, you know, democratic, I mean it used to be a democratic wave, now it's another crackdown, a series of crackdown and Thailand here and there. So how do you see the Myanmar as a part of overall democratization in Asia? So, so, hello again, this is Michelle from Myanmar. So I'm very glad to share my perspective here. So, and also thanks for giving me this opportunity and good to see our old professor and my classmate from next next year so so as you already know recently in myanmar the democratization situation is very critical and serious because uh in the last february the military took over the power with in the with the reason of the fraud election 
So starting from this February, we are always fighting and uh, showing our disobedience to the military junta. So in this situation, I, I would like to mention about some challenge for the democratization movement. So in this in this situation, the one of the big challenge just is since Myanmar has 135 ethnicity, and this is one third of the Myanmar population, and also we have so many ethnic M organization. Actually, uh, since we got independence from the British from 1948, we have so many civil war, which is with the ethnic M organization and the military. So, so this is one of the ethnic diversity is the big challenge. And also in our constitution and political governance, the, the dominant group is Bahman. So our constitution and the governance is Bahmanization. So which is we 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 are facing the ethnic minority oppressing by the military as well as by the by the majority ethnic city. And also, uh, now we have another one uh, government because a national unity government, which is found with the elected parliament member last election from last election. So even in this new government, we can see that the the the, Bahman, the the minority ethnic participation is very less, and also we can still see the the, the majority group dominant in the in the in, in the new government. So, and also want to mention is that. Since we were living in under the military region for a long time, so but recently we call it the democracy region, starting from 2020 to last year. But actually, this is the quasi democratization. But at the moment, the people who are old generation and also the most of the people are becoming the leadership worshiping politic because uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, because of the military constructed constructed structure so pe the people are very has ch less chance to learn about the politic so it became people to has less awareness of the politics so they have only focusing on the leader without any criticism or judgment so okay. Okay, done. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I think basically there are two um, the factors, like many other countries in Asia, again, this ethnic minority, you know, majority and the minority. At the same time, very weak, uh, you know, the issue, democracy institution, although Myanmar, uh, Myanmar was six, the last six years, so-called democracy, but the culture institution it's far from you know it's functioning you know this is the one of the reason that you know military could come back easily so these are the uh, very sad situation in Myanmar I think we have heard from the this about 10 countries so while listening to your sharing and your analysis I was trying to match with the, what Jo uh, Professor Jo just said he gave us a six framework you know six perspective at the same time the civic goals I think your Sharing conform, you know, is a political tool. Uh, I mean, uh, analytic, analytical tool uh, given by Joe Ode and also Civic Booth. That's why I want to move forward the last question. But unfortunately, we don't have much time left. So uh, first round is everybody compulsory, right? <laughs> but second time is optional. Feel free, you know. But also, I limit to only one minute, you know. And also, those who are not in panel, those who are in the Zoom, feel free to write down your ideas chatting room. You know, we'll collect all your ideas and share, and then 
share with you back okay so feel free to write down your comment because i cannot give you flow you know because time is very short so second question is so so what can you do you know a lot of sharing analysis and diagnosis and so on so what can you do as a means because I believe means it's a very huge network, you know, about 150 uh, alumni members. You are working on different countries, different sectors and NGOs, and some of your academics. How, what can we do together, you know? How can we strengthen our network? So no more network for study, but network for action on the ground, you know? But we are not alone, you know? We have many partner organizations, right, through you. And also May 18 Foundation can be also important ally. As you know, tomorrow we have a traditional annual award giving ceremony of Gwangju Prize for Human Rights. Do you know who is the winner of the Gwangju Prize for Human Rights? Again, Thailand. You know? Two years ago, also Thailand. That means Thailand is a really hot spot in this region. And also tomorrow there will be a launch of the network of the laureates of Gwangju Prize for Human Rights. We have about 30 you know, winners of Gwangju Prize, you know, so they are going to also work together as a network, you know, because no one can address this democratic challenge alone, you know, so we need to bring like-minded group together to, to work together more effectively, you know, so I think it's important for Mainz also we organize ourselves to be part of wider civil society or social movement, so what can you do? Already Civic Course gave us uh, six strategies, Protest, networking, research, advocacy, and the media and litigation. You know? So taking into account of these six, uh, give us the concrete suggestion. What can we do together? You know? Okay, so who wants to start? So feel free, based on what we have learned from different countries. Okay, groups, you want to one minute? Okay, suggestion, concrete suggestion. Yeah, my suggestion that uh, for the last 15 years we are studying as main, but we don't have a, we, we are not as good, mm -hmm. that means we are not uh, gathered together. So we need that kind of thing okay. to get together and work together. Okay. Because there are many things that we cannot, we can do many things as you suggested. Even last time for the Myanmar tour, we as 2020 students, we uh, released one statement. Okay. Because we couldn't get uh, gather other people. So mm -hmm. we need those things. Because even in Sri Lanka also, we are having many problems. May 18 is very important for Sri Lanka also. Mm -hmm. so, but three days back, there were uh, some priests, Catholic priests, they were preparing for uh, having the memorialization in Sri Lanka, the government forces. So, mm -hmm. so we need to... My, my, okay. okay. Uh, we need to support that, that kind of right. thing so last year, the main uh, back 2020, you issued a statement, right? About yeah. Hong Kong or about yeah. Thailand or Myanmar? Myanmar? About Myanmar. But it was only your year, 2020. Yeah. So if you are well organized, we can do, we can bring more people to join this type of solidarity action, right? That's what you are suggesting, no? Okay, uh, Lindu? I, mean, I want to extend it from this suggestion. I think it's good for men to have one platform, mm -hmm. uh, maybe Facebook or social media, to get all the consolidation of the content of the profile of the men. Because um, it's, it's really segregated. We don't know each other, right? Mm -hmm. And also uh, to update each other, or any of the see what they do mm -hmm. in that platform. Okay. Because I, I want to highlight the example of diplomacy training program. Mm -hmm. The Diplomacy DTP program is very networking platform. And then I was I was one of the alumni of this program. So there are like one almost thousands of network activists in global and and they have the profile and these are profile is just what we will do. And at the same time they will whatever issues they will issue the statement together. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like creating a strong solidarity action. Okay. Oh, you're a member of DTP, Australia, right? Yes. Okay, I was the old, you know, DTP, I think, to the 90s, 93. No? So I'm, I'm senior to you, you know? <laughs> DTP. Like a DTP, why don't we organize ourselves? But, you know, now very interesting, it's not only Mainz. We have also in Jeonnam University in Gwangju, they have a similar program, NGO studies, you know? So there are many Asians studying in Asia, uh, in South Korea, 
studying similar topic, the civil society, NGO, human rights, democracy. So first, we can organize ourselves, the main alumni together with the professors and main uh, 18 foundation, and then also other universities. Do you have any suggestion, Indu? Yeah, uh, it's great learning from the people's movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had civil war for ATK. Mm -hmm. uh, it was equal to abolish monarchy in the modern age. Mm -hmm. And then it was behind the black space, all people came together. Mm -hmm. And then uh, everyone uh, that time heard that the monarchy is the main barrier for the peace and justice in Nepal. So I think if uh, there is really people's movement, uh, then we can bring uh, democratic contributions. Uh, so it's very important to get united everyone. So uh, I agree with my point. Yeah, uh, we have to get united for democratic contributions. Okay. What about Zoom? Hi. Um, I think I would. Just to further your suggestions, I think two things. The first is platform for communication. I think right now we can use Facebook group. I don't know. I think it would be easy for everyone to use to share information, updates, uh, what's going on in our countries and stuff like that. And another thing may be platform for exchanges, mm -hmm. like seminar or like sharing session, you know, because I think People who study in Mainz, you, we came from different professions, like journalists, activists who working on different, different fields and stuff like that. So, so if we can kind of like um, organize themed uh, talk or sharing, or sharing session, session, it would be also good to get to know each other and also exchange. Yeah. yeah. I think in this moment, uh, Prof. Park Young, do you have any idea? People are asking, uh, we need to get organized. I don't know whether university, as a professor, you have any idea of supporting this type of initiative? Or well, Professor Chomie also you? Well, uh, Professor uh -huh. Chomie just left. Oh, uh, just she left. has another Zoom meeting. Okay. Well, uh, it's, very it's very challenging to me now. Um, unfortunately, we, uh, you know, means professors uh, have not Good job. done um, a good job so <laughs> far. I mean, we we taught students, we teach students, and after graduation, we are just very well. We are, we didn't do uh, you know some kind of a continuous organizing thing and working together thing. Um, uh, it's our limitation. In fact, uh, we've been uh, focusing on teaching mostly but, uh, but uh, i realized that last year uh, at the end of last year in fact uh, we need something uh, something to do this you know forum this meeting is the result of the uh, that kind of guess um let me think of uh, uh, some uh, other format of doing something together um, well, uh, well uh, today's forum is going to be like this, you know, uh, every year or every uh, half year, something like that. Uh, but uh, we may need something, some more thing. In addition, like that, you know, we may invite in addition to this, a few alumni to some university uh, for. You know, uh, teaching, teaching sometimes, sometimes uh, uh, and researching, and uh, we may uh, have some. You know, uh, after COVID nineteen, uh, we may uh, have some uh, irregular or regular meeting in different places, like mm -hmm. in Bangkok, in uh, Kathmandu, or you know, uh, wherever, um, regularly or irregularly. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, let me think of that, uh, Professor Cho and I will uh, work on it. Answer more uh, together. We will think about uh, what kind of things we can do uh, or we need to do for everyone. Okay, thank you. I think the May 18 Foundation, as you know, they have a very interesting forum, not only the Hangzhou Democracy Forum, 
As you know, uh, this is a new name. In the past, we call Gwangju Asia Forum, right? But now Gwangju Democracy Forum to make it more participatory and global and action oriented. And you know, they have a May 18 Academy and various programs. So maybe you can develop a cooperation program with the May 18 Foundation. Because May 18 Foundation is a more action oriented platform, right? And also many of us are already part of this network. So I think Songo University May 18 Foundation, we can do together, you know? And as I mentioned, you know, the lorries of Gwangju Prize for Human Rights. Okay, so let's put as a common agenda for our future discussion. Let me ask, uh, is there any more uh, questions? Uh, let me see whether I cannot see the hand up. Anybody wants to speak, uh, suggest about concrete action? Yeah, can I, can I make a suggestion? Answer yes, please, yes, please. I so you can yeah. write down at the same time, you can speak now, okay? Right, right. I would just, I just uh, mentioned something in writing as well. So I think, you know, what is uh, two things that are important and I'm coming from where we have commonalities. So if you're looking at the Indian situation, which is complex, we are a country, we are a lot of countries in one country and we have a lot of different problems. But there are a lot of commonalities between India and Myanmar. So if you look at the Rohingya situation in Myanmar, we have a lot of commons in Assam in the Northeast here and also across the entire country and also even in uh, Thailand. Uh, so, you know, I'm doing my PhD currently at the Mahidol Institute for uh, Peace and Human Rights. And there actually we have different students that we come together and we discuss common issues. Uh, these are PhD students, graduate students, and therefore we try and actually interact between ourselves and try and understand what can be discussed between us and what we can actually also take forward to our own, own setups here in the universities and in the civil society space. I think that is very important, but I would just like to mention this. Currently in India, and I think that's the same situation in Myanmar, somebody mentioned Facebook. I would discourage Facebook currently and any form of Facebook or WhatsApp or uh, Instagram or even Twitter, because all these social media are under complete surveillance by the government. The mm -hmm. only media that is working in so far as we are concerned is Signal. And I think Signal is something that is still more protected and where we can come together, network at least to start off with and understand what are the common issues going forward and then try and see how we can develop international solidarity. I think international solidarity is something that is so important today and we can organize our own own advocacy wherever we can given the restrictions that we have. And I've been talking to my friends in Myanmar, you know, where I've stayed for so long from 2008, I've been working there until 2016, I'm now back and I've been talking to them, but we keep on interacting in one form or the other. And we try and develop, uh, you know, we, we try and look at identify common issues. Now, just to end, I would just like to tell you this, that China is a big factor and yeah, China is responsible yeah. for the kind of things that we are seeing in our own own spaces, in our own own countries. And we are trying to therefore understand how the press, how international pressure can be put on China to not interfere yeah, yeah. with the political setup in the okay, different Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, yeah. So I think already more than enough. Okay, I think your suggestion is very concrete and as important, you know, cyber security, no? So we need to protect our own security as well, especially this day, everything, everything is now on the surveillance, right? So your suggestion is to create, a, uh, we have a Facebook, which is very vulnerable and the signal is another SNS. Let's discuss whether we can create a network. And also we have to do uh, like a stock taking, you no? Know? Because so before you are great, you produce or dissertation, right? All the research paper. So there's a concept of research activist combined, yeah? So now become activists. So how you can support each other, you, all your ideas you put in the research paper. So now in action, how we can create a network to support your action, you know, according to your research. So the stock taking about your ideas and your capability, your assets, I think that can be the first step, you know, stock taking. And then as you suggested, maybe you have a different, once we do stock taking, you can see the, what are the common issues? Of course not, we can say, you know, everybody is doing everything, right? So we have certain group of people working with like China or refugee issues and so on. So that way we can develop our concrete working, the, you know, the mechanisms. Okay, so any more before we end? One, uh, any, yes, please, one minute, please. Is there any more? And Salvo, can I? Yes, please, uh, one minute, please. 
Okay, I'm Musa from 2008, India, mm -hmm. uh, Varanasi, the constituency of our Prime Minister Modi. I just want to add two things. One, to think was sinking this uh, civil space or democracy is, I think one part was missing that I want to add here, like the how this capitalist forces controlled media planted, projected and planted the current democratic governments, uh, main of the major countries and how they are playing the role, how the current existing governments become a puppet. That one part need to be more discussed, I think. And the second is, I, I will be uh, support Vidhayat. Okay, we need to come together into the one sig uh, platform like sing Signal and where we can for come together first. Maybe if we are able to one platform, then we can move forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I want to invite one special person. Uh, is it Chloe Simmons here? You know, she, she's uh, one of the alumni. Uh, she is in Guangzhou by self quarantine. She came from UK, but she cannot come to this place because of, she's in Guangzhou, but she's quarantined. Chloe? Hello, yes, I'm here. Yeah, can you say hello to everybody? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, sorry, my connection is not good enough for a good video link, but uh, it's really good to see everybody. And I want to extend my thanks to uh, to the organizers at May 18th, to all of our professors and to all of the fellow students here. Uh, many people from the batches before me and after me. And I've learned a huge amount through the session today uh, from hearing about the situation in all of these different countries. And I agree with the assessment by Civicus. Uh, and I thought the map was very useful uh, to give us an overview of the situation in the different countries. So thank you very much for that presentation and many thanks to all of the panelists as well. Thank you. I hope I can see you all soon one way or another. Okay, I hope to see you soon when you finish self uh, quarantine, the 14 days quarantine right, in South Korea, you know? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so now more or less, I said time's up. So let's uh, wrap up our sessions. And I want to also let you know, uh, today is the first day of Gwangju Democracy Forum. We have uh, four more days. As you know, traditionally tomorrow, you know, the big official ceremony in the morning, afternoon, award giving ceremony, and uh, opening session, and also the Gwangju Democracy Summit. So we are all uh, invited to join. And there's a Zoom link. And also Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, there are, there are many free sessions. Uh, I think it's several sessions about Myanmar. No? So different uh, international NGO, they are organizing session Myanmar and also South Asia, Southeast Asia. So feel free to join various sessions. And then we'll share with you the, all your comments in the chatting room and also with uh, some common actions. So your ideas will be part of Gwangju Democracy Agenda 2030. No? As I said, you know, Gwangju Democracy Forum hope to be very action oriented. So we collect all the suggestions for action and put together and then we review annually. No? And also I hope uh, Gwangju May 18 Foundation, they will monitor and they will try to provide any necessary support. So it's become the, the process, not only one or two day event. No? So I think in that sense, we can be part of this process, you know, democracy, let's say pushback, you know, democracy. And is it Joseph? Are you still in the room, Joseph, from Civicus? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so you gave us ideas So how Civicus can support this initiative. <laughs> this is the final point. So you are a global platform for action, right? For civic space. So now you know what we are planning to do. Give us some idea and then how you can support or how we can work together this as an ending note. Joseph? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think one is, of course, the, the information and your analysis on the ground is very useful because obviously we cannot capture everything. We are not, we're not a very large organization. So, uh, you know, if you are seeing things that we are not seeing, uh, you know, when you go onto the Civicus platform, feel free to share that information uh, with us. If you think there are particular issues or or actions that need to be taken, uh, we can see how we can also coordinate together with Civicus and other international NGOs to support you in different ways. I think that's one. Uh, capacity building, if you need, you know, if there are trainings, if there are particular skills that, that the network needs or the network can offer to other groups on the ground, we can help and facilitate that in, in some way. And of course, you know, your writings, you tell your stories, and I think Civicus can also be a platform to share those stories. So I think there are multiple ways 
we can connect. Um, and I'm happy to be involved in any conversation moving forward, uh, Anselmo. Okay, thank you, Joseph. So now we have a strong global partner for the main. Okay. So once again, I would like to thank May 18 Foundation first. You know, they provide the space and also funding support, and many other things. And also all the panelists and presenters. And let's give a big hand to everybody. And then okay, hope to see you. Bye bye. Keep in touch. Stay safe.